So I've got something I want you to take a look at. Uh, do you know, and you can guess in your mind, uh, how many possessions, items ex- ex- are in, found in the average American's house right now? You know, just in your own mind, you can think about it. How many, the average American family is 300,000 items in their house. Now, of course, they're not all in their house, right? They're in their garage, they're in the attic, they're in the basement, they're in the, or they're in the storage shed that they're renting, right? Because they just can't keep up with all of it. So 300,000. Not that long ago, the stat was 250,000. We are really doing good. We are making that number climb fast. And I'll tell you what, if I do it in a couple of years, I bet it'll be even higher than that, right? It's just a massive amount of stuff. And the problem is um, about 84% of Americans are really worried about, do I have it organized enough? And, do I, and, it's, and, and 55% of us admit that it's causing stress to have so much stuff everywhere. But it doesn't stop us from buying more stuff. It's just making us anxious about it all, right? So you go into the average American's house, and it's just absolutely crammed full of stuff. But that's not all. Uh, did you know that in 1975, the average store had 8,948 items you can buy? By 2008, that number had climbed to 47,000. In 33 years, it went up over five times. And that doesn't, that's 2008, it's bigger now. And on top of that, it didn't take in, in 2008 to what you can just go online and buy on Amazon. I looked it up this morning, counting back-ordered items, things that aren't really available to purchase right now, but you can still buy them and wait. There are over 70 million items you can buy on Amazon right now. So you could spend days just scrolling through all the things you want to buy. So we're cluttered in our homes, we're cluttered in our stores, we're cluttered in our online stores. But even this, neuroscience has shown that the average American spend, has 6,200 thoughts per day, less if you're a Bears fan. But uh, the rest of them, they have 6,200 thoughts per day. So you just think about that in the, in the time that you're awake, you're constantly having things in your mind going off. And then you turn around in your house and everywhere you look, there's hundreds of thousands of items and you go to a store, you go to an online store, and there's just millions of things. And this is just three areas of our life. And if you were to use one word to describe American society right now, you could use a lot, but one of the words you would probably use is the word distracted, right? I mean, our houses are cluttered, our minds are cluttered, our stores are cluttered. Everywhere we go, it's like noise, 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 noise. There's so much. And in the middle of all of this chaos in the lives that we live, we, get, we lose sight of things that are really, really most important. And it's happening in America. We've really lost sight of what's really important. So I thought, you know, in the weeks leading up to Easter, I wanted to do a series that I'm starting today called Essentials. And we're going to talk about life truths that really mattered. And I want, to, I, want, I want to really talk about the four most essential things that I'm aware of. These are the four most essential things. These are also the things that will make you spiritually come alive, which I thought was an important subject to talk about going into Easter. These are the four reasons why you're still breathing on earth. For those of you still breathing here today, you uh, have these four purposes in your life, and I wanted to really zero in on these as we go into this uh, season that's so important. So we're going to start with the number one essential, and Jesus told us what it was. One day, Jesus was approached by somebody who said, hey, what is the most important commandment? And many of you know what he said. He said, without pausing, he said, this is it. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. So that's it. That's what it is. That's what life is about. Number one thing. While you're breathing on earth, the number one goal you should have in your life is, and look at this first part, love the Lord your God, is to love him. Uh, My question to you really directly at the beginning of this is, do you love him? Do you love him? And I really want you to think about, do you love him as much as you love your best friend? or as much as you love your grandchildren, or your spouse, or your grandma and grandpa, or your, do you love him? We're gonna come back to that. But then he also says, and then this word gets me every time, look at, well, it's the same word four times, all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. Do you love him? And do you love him with all of who you are? Can you say that? I honestly cannot say that's where I'm at, but I can honestly tell you that's where I want to go. 
to learn to love God and to love him with all of who I am. The problem is, like I said earlier, we live in a world that's so distracting, right? The world that we live in says, no, no, you should love sports and shopping and Amazon purchases and hobbies and work and toys and games and money, right? And money especially. I mean, America, if we had an altar that we all bowed down to in American society, it would be a big pile of cash, right? This is the God of America. It's always about more and more and more, getting more, having more, using that to buy more and have a wonderful retirement. It's all about more and more and more, constant about more. And it takes us and distracts us away from what's really important. And the question I really want you to think about too is as we bow in worship in the altar of more, uh, are we getting better as a nation? I mean, we have more than any nation that's ever, ever existed. And are we as a nation getting better? I mean, other words you could use to describe American society besides distracted, couldn't you use suicidal, unsatisfied, depressed, burned out? Alcoholics, addicted, destructive spending, angry. Couldn't we use those words? I mean, the, the more we pursue all of these distractions, the worse we get. And yet we continue to pursue them. They just can't give us what we really want because I, I love how C.S. Lewis worded it. He put it this way. He said, out of, out of that hopeless attempt has come nearly all that we call human history. Money, poverty, ambition, war, prostitution, classes, empires, and slavery, he said. The long, terrible story of man trying to find something other than God which will make him happy. I mean, all that list I just showed you is the long, terrible list of Americans trying to find something other than God that will make them happy. But the cool thing about God is he says when, when we get this right and we love him and we really grow in our love for him, then we get all of these things added in. You don't have to aim at these things. You aim at God and he just gives you these things. He gives you joy and he gives you peace and this feeling of security being held in his hands. Safe, protected, calm, happy, satisfied, hopeful. This is what he offers us. It's everything we think we're gonna get by the next purchase or accomplishment and it doesn't ever come but it's offered freely in Jesus if we learn to love him. So, like I said, we're starting this series today, Essentials, Life Truths That Really Matter, and I wanna try and answer the question, how, do I, how can I really love God? So I wanna ask you to open your program, take out your notes, and grab a pen. There, this is really important, and I apologize, I'm not even getting through a fraction of this today, sorry. We're really just gonna do only a couple of these, so. But I, I want to talk to you about what I've been learning. So it all starts here, though. We're going to start with just this first one. Number one, you've got to figure out what you believe about God's love. You've got to figure out what you believe about God's love. And that's the question I want you to answer. Do I believe that God loves me? Do I believe that? Well, only you can answer that. Do you actually believe that God loves you? And it's the most important thing for what we're gonna be talking about. If I wanna learn how to love God, then I have to solve that question, I have to really answer that question. I have to resolve it in my mind that he loves me. And here's why, look at this verse. First John four nineteen. we love, why? Because he first loved us. So in other words, he says that my, as I, my love for God is directly related to my knowledge and awareness of how much he loves me. I love him, I can ch 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 change the pronouns, I love him because he first loved me. So that's, why, that's how my love grows. If I can understand more about how he loves me, my love will naturally grow. So you gotta resolve what you believe about that. The truth, according to the Bible, is this, that God loves me, and you could put, I really struggled to put the right word in there, this was my guess, my best guess. It's unstoppable love. It's that he loves me unstoppably. And here's just one of many verses in the Bible, some of my favorite verses about the love of God, Ephesians 3, may you have the power to understand. And it's like he's trying to put it in a box, how wide this box is, how long it is, how high and how deep it is that contains the love that God has for you. And he says, I, 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 I wish you had the power to understand his great love for you. But then he said, and, and then to experience this love, though it's too great to understand fully, 
But he said, look what happened. Then you would be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. So make no mistake about it. Some of you can say, true or false, God loves me, true. And you know it in your head. Is that what the verse says that God wants for you? Does God just want you to know it in your head? No, if you're, if you're following along on your notes, circle that word experience in the verse. He doesn't want you just to know it. He wants you to experience his love for you. That's not head knowledge, is it? Here's my question then based on that. When was the last time you felt deeply loved by God? You experienced his love. See, that's totally different, isn't it? We settle for intellectual assent. Yes, I know God loves me. That's not what he's offering. He's saying, I want you to experience my love for you. To, to experience what it's like to be loved by this real God. And then he says, by the way, if that happens in your life, when it happens, when you get to experience his love, look what will happen to you. Spiritually, you'll be made complete. You will have a fuller life and power. So all those other things that we're trying to find in the, in, in the things of this world, he said, you'll never find them there. They only lead to dead ends for you. Instead, if you will pursue the love of God and loving God, he will, you will experience his love and it'll change your whole life. You will have fullness of life and power. What does that power mean? I have no idea. I have no idea. Many times I'm reading the Bible, I have no idea. But how many of you would describe your life as powerful? Spiritual power. And he says, it's all rooted in understanding this love of God. So some of you who have been, usually it's because you've been deeply hurt in life, deeply wounded in life, you're like, how can I believe that God loves me? I mean, love has to be proven, right? And the greatest evidence of proof is always in what you're willing to give for somebody else. I love World War II history. And there are stories of soldiers in foxholes in World War II, and all of a sudden, a grenade from the enemy would land in the foxhole. And they only had a, you know, a split second to make a decision. Do they all try and climb out? Do they all just freeze? I mean, those things happen. But once in a while, you hear the story of a soldier seeing the grenade land, and he covers the grenade with his body. And he takes death to save the men he loves in the hole with him. I mean, that's love, right? That Jesus said, there is no greater love than a man would lay down his life for somebody else. I mean, that would be the greatest example of love. If, if, I, if God actually loved us, he would, he would really do something amazing for us. Well, God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were, once we had cleaned up our lives, right? That's what the end of that verse says? While we were still a mess. While we were still sinners. What was happening this day in this place was he was falling on the grenade for us. He covered all the unloving things I've ever said and ever done. He covered them. He took death for me so that I could live. This is the offer of Jesus, the proof of his great, great love. In the Bible, when you read descriptions of his love, you see that it is, contains a list of this. Here's what I need you to understand about God's love for you. He sees everything about everything you've hidden in your life, everything. He sees it all, he loves you anyway. He relentlessly pursues you. There is never a moment where he is not after you, ever, because he just loves you. He's the pursuing God. We're the running away people and he just won't let us go. He takes us back again and again when we've blown it. Doesn't matter how many times you've blown it, even if it's the millionth time for the exact same thing, he keeps taking you back because that's what you do when, when you love. Our, his love for us is completely undeserved. His love for me is in spite of. His love for us is in spite of. He never gives up on us and has a greater purpose for our lives. And you want to see how powerful his love is, I, I want to point you to the story of this woman. Her name is Sandy Patty. I've told the story once a long time ago. Sandy used to be in the 80s. She was one of the most popular Christian singers in America. She had a dynamic range. If you go look her up online, you can hear Sandy Patty. It's just amazing music. I actually saw her in concert once in the Twin Cities. And it was an incredible experience. Not long after I saw her, though, um, her career fell apart. She had been unfaithful with another, um, I think it was a member of her crew. 
and it was caught, and she was, you know, done. Nobody went to see her concerts anymore, and she stopped singing. She just lived in this shell, this shell of a person, and obviously was symptomatic of st other stuff going on underneath in her life, so she started going to see a counselor. She started attending a Bible study group called Bible Study Fellowship, and she had this mentor in that group who was constantly saying to her, Sandy, God loves you, God loves you. And her reaction internally, every time she heard the phrase, is the same reaction some of you have. Her reaction was, but I'm a terrible person. She said, I'm bad, these are her words, I'm bad, I'm ugly, I'm fat, I've done this terrible thing, this awful thing. He couldn't possibly love me. And some of you recognize that as a, a big shame message. And she was so ashamed of her life that she thought God could never love her, but she was in a place now with counselors and all these Christians around her and reading the Bible that she could not escape the overwhelming evidence that God loved her, God loved her, God loved her, God loved her. And so one day she said, she came to the conclusion and she said this, well, okay, he's God. It's his job. He's got to love me. He's obligated. So she accepted the love of God, sort of. And then one day, one of those mentors said, honey, God likes you too. And she said, what? And her mentor said, yeah, he doesn't just love you. He likes you. And he wants to be your friend. And she said, wait a second, honestly, God likes me? She said, the names of people in my life whom I loved but didn't particularly like popped into my mind. She said, loving someone is a whole different thing, that, or liking someone is a whole different thing than loving them. And she thought, to be liked by the God of the universe? That would mean that he chooses me. That he chooses to spend time with me just because he wants to. She said, I heard someone say, if God had a fridge, your picture would be on it. And she said, I only put pictures of people in my fridge whom I enjoy. Could God possibly feel that way about me? And as this truth started settle, settling in, she wondered what her life would be like if every day she said, I lived as if I was the most loved and liked person in the world. As she began to live in this new awareness, she found herself worrying less, having less fear, her confidence grew, she was able to offer grace and understanding, and it changed her life to understand that God doesn't just love you, it's not an obligated love, he absolutely loves you and likes you too. So the question, do I believe that God loves me just as I am? And do I believe that God likes me just as I am? And he actually wants to be my friend and wants friendship with me. And the reason this is essential is because that verse says, I love him because he first loved me. So if you understand this, then it has the potential to make your love for God grow. Now, the rest of this on your notes is really important and I just don't have time to, to do it today because I wanna have you jump down to number four and I want you to write this down. And um, this, is, this is something new I wanna talk to you about. And it's just kinda of taken over everything else I was planning to say because of, well, you'll hear. So build a personal, this friendship with Jesus. If you really wanna love him, this is what you have to do. So I'm gonna ask for a little bit of, I'm gonna, this is just me telling my story. Okay, so I'm just gonna tell you a big story here about me learning how, what it means to actually love him and to pursue a friendship with him. So this is an unfinished story. And it felt really risky. I debated it all week whether I was gonna even talk about this. And finally this morning, I'm like, I've, I've just gotta take the risk and talk to you about it. Uh, even though I, I don't have all the answers and I can't explain it better than I'm about to tell you right now. But friendship with Jesus is such a cliche, I hate the word. The other phrase that we use all the time in churches is personal relationship. You can have a personal relationship with Jesus. We're like, what does that mean? I mean, friendship, what does that mean? How many of you have a friend? Okay, hopefully all of you have friends, right? 
How many of you love Jesus and have friendship with him like you have with your best friend? It's ridiculous to say, isn't it? It's not even close. It's the words that we use all the time. Even the whole idea of loving God, which is what this message is all about. It's what Jesus said it's all about. That doesn't even make sense because, um, you know, I've got three grandkids. I love my grandkids. I got to spend time with my grandson Lincoln this last few days, eight months old. Oh, happiness and love. It's like amazing. Just like, I love him. And God says, I'm supposed to love him even more than I even love Lincoln. Well, it's different, right? Isn't it? And we just settle for it being different. But we don't really know what it means to love him. And as I thought about this a lot over the last week, I really thought part of the reason is we don't tend to think of Jesus as a real person. Jesus tends to be, for most Christians, an idea or a thought in our head. Or like I've described before, it's like cardboard Jesus. It's like, yep, I believe in Jesus. He's a real thing. Here's my cardboard Jesus. Uh, But uh, you can love cardboard Jesus, but he doesn't really love you back, right? You don't experience love. I I can love this potted plant. Uh, I love it, but am I going to experience love from the potted plant? No. And is it really love? Am I going to want to have my potted plant in, as my best friend? No. It's, and this is kind of how it is with, with Jesus for the average Christian because we do not understand the real offer. And I've been guilty of this for most of my Christian life. We tend to think of it, again, it's like it's, we treat him like he's not even a real person. And, and yet the offer in the Bible, and I talked about this in a series that we did in January, The offer in the Bible from God is real relationship with him, friendship with him. We have songs where we sing about these things, but we don't actually experience it. But the word is fellowship, which is what happens when friends get together, they just have a great time. And like the verse I just showed you, an experience of the love of God. And that is such a critical question for you to answer. When was the last time you experienced the personal love that God has for you? When was the last time you experienced that? See, we just settle for so much less. We've turned Christianity into a church service, into doing good things, into taking communion once in a while, and that's what we've reduced it down to, and it never was supposed to be any of those things. It was always supposed to be this stuff with God, who is a real and personal God. This is the offer. Matter of fact, look at how specific it is in just one different place in the Bible, Ephesians 3, uh, again, then Christ will make his, well, he'll make his home in your hearts as you trust in him and your, your roots will grow down deep into God's love and that will just keep you strong. If you're not strong, then there's no t- connection to the deep love that God has for you. So, I mean, the, the, look at what he's promising. He'll make his home in your heart. I didn't make that promise to you. He made it. So just think about it. Again, this doesn't make any sense if it's just an idea or a concept or a thing, right? Yesterday we went shopping, bought some clothing. We brought the clothing into the house. It's sitting in bags right in the living room. You know, the clothing does not consider itself, oh, I'm home, right? It's an inanimate object. It's just like this potted plant. I could bring this home and it wouldn't be like, yay, I'm home. But a person can come home, right? Right? You, can, you consider some place here on earth your home, and when you walk in, many times it's like, oh, I'm home. That's the offer from Jesus. Only it's not, it, look at where it's going to be. It's going to be in your heart. Your heart becomes his home. So the offer is so specific and so big, and we settle for something so much less. And so I did this series back in January called Fresh Start, and I meandered into topics I wasn't even thinking about when I planned the thing, which often happens with me. So once I start studying something and learning and teaching about it, it often goes in directions I don't anticipate, and I'm just trying to follow wherever it goes. And we talked a lot about this. We talked a lot about Jesus being a real person, and you can have friendship with him that's closer than any friendship you have on earth, And you can actually not just talk at him. That's not friendship, right? Like I can talk at this potted plant. But if the potted plant starts talking back, we're all in trouble, right? Well, I'm in trouble. But the relationship is the offer and friendship is the offer. And God is offering personal communication in a brand new relationship where you get to experience his love. 
That's the offer. So I started in January. Um, I bought this little book. It's one of my favorite authors, Frank Laubach. I talk about him regularly. I talk about him for sure pretty much every January. This little book is so short. If, if you got a Kindle, if you like to read it all, get this. It's a few bucks. It's no big deal. Usually, uh, I think I bought it for like $3 on my Kindle. And then what I've done every day in the morning is, well, it started, and then I read through the whole thing. It, it's only like 90 pages long. The chapters are usually, um, they don't even fill a page. So it's like 20 seconds, 30 seconds to read it, and it's his personal journey with Jesus, and it is stunning what you read. He's not alone with it. Other heroes of the faith of mine, George Mueller, Hudson Taylor, these people I talk about regularly, they have the same experiences with God. And it, here's just one of the things he said in his book. There have been a succession of marvelous experiences of the friendship of God. I feel, as I look back over the year, that it would have been impossible to have held much more without breaking with sheer joy. Is that your description? Is that how you feel this morning when you came here, when you flipped on the, the message? You just feel like you're about to break because you have so much joy in your heart. That is a byproduct of the first part of that, the friendship of God. And again, we think the joy is going to come in the purchase. The joy is going to come in the accomplishment. The joy is going to come in the shopping or the Badgers winning it in the NCAA tournament. That's where the joy is going to come from, right? It's going to come from something out here. And the whole time, the joy is the byproduct of the friendship with Jesus. And if you build the friendship with Jesus, you just get it. He didn't pursue joy, he pursued Jesus, and joy came along with Jesus. Jesus brings everything we want. Joy and contentment and hope and peace and love, all of it. He brings it all, and we just have to pursue him. And so as I was reading through this book, I mean, day after day, and I've read it multiple times, but this time I read it with a much more serious attitude. I'm like, I'm really going to do what he says. And towards the end of the book, he has this game with minutes. And the game with minutes I've talked about before, if you haven't heard me talk about it, it's about trying to in an hour, you really focus on Jesus for an hour and you try and make your mind think about him one time per minute for an hour and then you keep track of it and at the end of the hour you see how well you did. And I think the best I've ever done in one hour is 42 times. So for one hour, 42 times I thought about him and, he, you, and he's got all these ideas. You can, you can sing a hymn or a, a so, Christian song. You can have a picture next to you that reminds you of Jesus. You can have a cross. There's all these different ideas. This time I wasn't thinking about playing the game with minutes, but here were some of the things I read in this book that just, again, stunned me. He said, have an empty chair beside you and imagine that Jesus is sitting in it. And then he said this thing that honestly is weird to me, okay? This is weird to me. He said, and then if possible, reach your hand out and touch that chair as though you were holding his hand. Because the truth is he's there, for he said, I'm with you always. Because he's God. Do you know what that means? He's not us, which means, you know, I'm limited. I can only be here. I can't be here and in Argyle. I can't do that. I can be here or not here. But he's God. He's omnipresent. He can be everywhere. He can be in your heart and mind at the same time, in the same way. And he can be right here. I can't see him. But it doesn't mean he's not there. He's, he's everywhere. So that's what he's saying. And the whole idea of reaching out and holding his hand, it's like, oh, that's kind of a weird thing. But this time through, I'm like, I'm doing all of it. I'm going to try this. He said, when you're walking outdoors, he said, I love this. He said, remember that beauty is the voice of God. Isn't that a good sentence? Beauty is the voice of God. He said, every plant, every tree, every bush, every lake, every sunset is speaking to you. He said, so when you see it, ask God this. What are you trying to tell me through all of this? And really listen for him. What are you telling me? Then he said, if you've wandered to a place where you can talk out loud and alone, speak to the invisible companion who is right by your side. He said, when you're walking down a hallway, make room for him because, as a reminder that he's present with you right now. So ask him what is most on his mind and then answer back. This was weird to me too. Ask him what's most on your mind. And then answer back aloud with your voice what you believe he would say to you. So like I said, this time I'm like, I'm just, I'm doing it all. That was super weird to do the first time I ever did it. But he said, Jesus has only happened when we, happy, happy when we are bringing every question with him. 
And he said, here's the goal. Your unseen friend becomes closer and more wonderful every day until at last you know him by experience. So I started doing this back in January. So it's been two months now of this experiment doing this. In the morning when I get up, uh, my alarm goes off at five and I sit on the couch in the living room and I do message prep for Sunday from five to seven. And I sit on the end of the couch and I pretend that right next to me, Jesus is sitting the whole time. I don't try and picture his face, but I, it's, I just picture Jesus sitting there. I don't know how to explain it different than that. He is right next to me. Because he's also here, but he's also here. Even this morning in the service, multiple times, I've pictured him being right next to me. So, helping me with this message. So if it's really bad, blame him. So, um, but I picture him with me all the time. And then periodically I will do exactly what Frank said to do, even though it's weird to me. I will reach over and pretend like I'm taking his hand. And then I'll just talk to him about whatever's on my mind. So this morning, what was on my mind as I was driving here, you know, I drive alone in the morning because I get here early. And so the car seat's open. I, I love to picture him when I'm in the car with, driving. And I put my hand over and, and took his hand. And I, and I talked to him about a problem in my life that's too big for me to fix. I cannot fix this problem. It's beyond me. And it, it's, it's painful to me. And I just talked to my friend about it. And I, when I'm alone, I talk to him. Many times, if you could catch me praying, you would see my hand out like this, like I've taken the hand of my friend. So I know it sounds super weird. I don't know how, how it sounds to you, but the two things that it's made me do is constantly think about Jesus. All day long, what, I, I work at home three days of the week, so I'm alone the whole day. I don't put a chair next to me, but constantly during the day, I look to my right, it's almost always my right, I guess he likes to stand over here, and I picture him standing next to me, and I talk to him about the work that I'm doing, or the problems I'm, I'm worried about, and I've just made, it, it's made me think about him constantly, but here's the better thing, it's reminded me constantly that I'm talking to a person, the person of Jesus, not an idea, not a concept, not prayers bouncing off a ceiling. I'm talking to a friend, and his name is Jesus. The results of this experiment have been amazing for me in the last two months. It's interesting how much easier temptation is to resist when you're really thinking about your friend Jesus. And again, I wasn't setting out to find a temptation trick. I wasn't. I was just focusing on Jesus and temptation went down because, by the way, one of the things he says he will give you is self-control. It's one of the things that comes with Jesus. Moments of peace, just this supernatural peace that everything's going to be okay. There have been some tough things in the last couple of months, and I've said to him multiple times, I've taken his hand and said, you're coming with me, right? <laughs> and his answer is always, yeah, I'll come with you. That you got to do that hard thing? I'll come with you. And it's just like this peace, like, okay, I'll be right because I got Jesus. Awareness of his presence, which is so cool. Just this constant awareness that he is present with me at all times. I never am out. Of, uh, he, I never, never miss him. He's always with me. This is amazing. If you ask me when the last time I experienced his love, I can give you multiple examples in the last two months. There have been times when I've been so overwhelmed by how much he loves me that it makes tears come to my eyes. Which is the promise, right? That's what he said. I want you to experience his love, not intellectually know it here, but know it right here in your heart so that you feel loved by God. And I don't know if this is right. I don't know if it works for everybody. I'm just telling you right now, it's the most amazing thing for me. And joy and worship. I, I mean, there are some times that I just hit loop on these songs and just worship him. This morning, I came into prep early, and the radio was on. It was on the Christian radio, and it was, it was a song called In Christ Alone. And it is a beautiful worship song, and I just stopped. I couldn't even go over and set up and do what I had to normally do. I had to just stop and just stand there. And I, and I pictured the words as I pictured Jesus right there with me, and I was just saying, thank you. And I listened to the words, because I was there about my friend Jesus. There about my friend and I wanted him to know how grateful I was. 
And all of this ties into what Jesus said in John 15. These are my favorite verses in the Bible. I know I say many times, oh, that's one of my favorites. That's one of my favorites. These are my favorites. In John 15, Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. And he said, if you remain in me, you'll bear much fruit, because that's what branches do. A branch, if you cut that branch off the vine, right, is that branch gonna be okay? Is it ever gonna produce fruit again? No, it's dead. It may still have some semblance of life, but the moment it's disconnected from the vine, it starts to die, right? You ever trim a, a, a tree or a bush? You know what happens. They still look green for a while, and then they slowly start to die. But he said, I am the vine, and all you have to do to experience life is remain connected to him. And if you remain connected to him, he just pours his life into you. Branches don't have to work really hard to bear fruit, do they? All they have to do is stay connected to the vine, and if the vine is healthy, fruit is the natural outcome. And the fruit is the, the list that I showed you earlier. Joy and peace and happiness and contentment and love and kindness and self-control and all of these things. It's the natural byproduct of making Jesus your true friend, not a concept, not an idea, and not reducing Christianity to going to church once in a while. If you take it down to that, then I don't even know why you're here. You're missing everything. True joy, life, and love found in him. One of the amazing experiences I had took place a few weeks ago, and I am constantly aware of my friend Jesus with me. And I was talking to this person who has kind of a really broken person, really kind of really broken and rough on the outside. And I was standing and he was talking at me. We weren't talking. <laughs> you know people like that, they just talk at you. And so I was standing there and normally it would annoy me and normally it would bother me, but again, I had Jesus with me. And so at one point as he was talking at me, you know, I, I can gotten to the point now where I can just talk to Jesus in my mind without even having to look. This time he was on my left. So yeah. I was standing next to a cabinet. He couldn't be over there, so <laughs> of course he could be. But I, I just pictured and I said, uh, you, you really love him, don't you? And it was like this enormous emotion inside of Jesus as he said, yes. And all of a sudden I felt like this wave of love towards this person just fill me. And it got so easy to stand there and let him talk at me because I felt a moment, just the smallest amount of the, the ocean of love that Jesus, my friend, has for that man. It wasn't my love, because I would have been annoyed. But I'll tell you, my friend Jesus, he's not annoyed. He's crazy in love with that guy. His greatest dream for that man is that that man would get to know him and let his love just, just, cover his life. And I felt it. And it was amazing. I don't know how that sounds. I have no idea. All I know is that I want everything that the New Testament says that this is. Friendship with God. Relationship with God. Not ritual and not religion. So I want you to know that he can be your closest friend. He can be the true treasure of this world. He loves you, and by the way, he likes you too. When I, you want to do something after, if you take this experiment and you start doing this with me, after you've been doing it a while, ask him, ask him, how do you feel about me? And then speak as if he was talking and see what happens. Incredibly powerful. So if you're going to do something today from this, two things I would say is thank him for liking you. That's a really good thing to start thanking him for. That he doesn't just love you, that he likes you. But I really want you to figure out some way to make the friendship the focus. What will you do? I'm telling you what I'm doing and I'm telling you the results. I'm telling you how much fun this is. The things that you experience with him you will never get in this world, ever. There is no purchase you can ever buy that will give you joy. 
There's no purchase you can ever got, buy that will give you contentment. <laughs> it gives you the opposite of that. You just want the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. I want you to try this with me. If, if, if the habit you start with is an empty chair, keep an empty chair by you where you work if that works out and just constantly turn back to the day and really try that experiment. I know it's super weird, especially maybe just weird for me as a guy because I don't like holding the hand. So, but try that. Reach out periodically and take his hand and talk to him and make it about a real friendship. The closest friendship that you've ever had. Make it about that. Let him start to pour his love and life into you. Let me have you bow your heads as we finish today. Some of you, this is so weird, so strange to hear all of this. To believe in a personal God is one thing, but to believe that he wants to actually be your friend is just so foreign to everything you've ever heard. And it may sound too good to be true, and the tr truth is, it is. It's, it's too good, but it's not too good to be true. You matter so much to him. But the friendship with Jesus begins with the decision you make to let him, let, let him into your life. Like that verse said, he wants to make his home in your heart. You have to make the decision to open your life to Jesus. It's a decision that changed my life when I made this decision so long ago. None of this stuff will work until you make this initial decision. And you can make it right now, sitting here today or watching online. You can just make a decision with because of what he did for us. He died on the cross. Like I said, he fell on the grenade for us. He took death so that we could come alive. If you want his gift of friendship, with your head bowed, just say something like this in your heart to him. Say, Jesus, I want to be your friend. I know that I've done things and said things that are unloving and wrong. And I heard that you went to that cross for me, so please forgive me. Would you start a friendship with me today? I don't want religion. I don't want rules. I just want you. Come and make your home inside of my heart today. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, as we finish up today, I want to ask you all, if you wouldn't mind, would you grab your little connection card out of the, out of the program? I know I ask you to do it every week. Just If you're a regular tender, just put your name down so we know you're here. But then... Maybe some of you prayed and asked Jesus to forgive you or renewed your commitment. Just let us know about that. You can check this box. If you check the box, we'll send you some stuff in the mail as a way of saying thank you for letting us know about it. If you want us to pray about something in your life or you have a comment you want, you can, this is how you communicate with us as a church. Just take a moment and fill this out and then drop it in one of the two offering boxes on the back wall where you came in. Thanks for coming. Hope you enjoy the rest of your week.